Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. On November 2nd, 2023, with the help of AI, the Beatles released their final song. It's called Now and Then. It sounds like this. I know it's true. And despite coming out over four decades after John's death and two decades after George's, it supposedly features genuine artistic contributions from all four members of the band. And the more I listen to it, the more I find myself feeling confused. That's why it took me so long to make this video. This song brought up a lot of questions for me. Like, what does it mean for there to still be new Beatles music in 2023? How did this happen? Why did this happen? And how should I feel about the fact that it did happen? I'm still not sure, but I'm gonna try to figure it out. Let's start with how it happened, because that seems like the easiest part. The story begins in 1994, during the creation of the Beatles Anthology, a series of three albums featuring old rare recordings. Or actually, the story really begins in 1977, in John Lennon's apartment at the Dakota in New York City, but we'll get to that. While working on the anthology, the three surviving Beatles got together to discuss the project and quickly realized they wanted to do something more. They missed each other and wanted to actually make music together again. But the band was adamant that they wouldn't replace anyone, so if this was gonna be new music by the Beatles, then one way or another, it needed to include John. Fortunately, George had a solution. He'd been talking with John's widow, Yoko Ono, and she informed him that she still had a couple of his old demos. In the late 70s, he'd stepped away from the world of professional music in order to focus on raising their son, Sean, but he still wrote and recorded some songs privately, presumably intending to finish them once Sean was older. Sadly, he never got the chance, but with Yoko and Sean's blessing, there seemed to be no one more qualified to do it for him than his old bandmates. The initial plan was to take three of these songs and use each one to anchor one of the volumes of the anthology. Volume 1 began with Free as a Bird, the first new Beatles song in 25 years. And Volume 2 followed that up with Real Love. Just like little girls and boys. Both of which are... fine. They don't really sound like Beatles songs to me, and producer Jeff Lynne had to process the hell out of John's voice in order to isolate it, but given the technological limitations at the time, there's not a lot more they could have done with those demos. But when Volume 3 came out, there was no new song to go along with it. And, I mean, they tried. Yoko gave them a third track, but after spending about a day with it, George declared it, and I quote, f***ing rubbish, and since Ringo was also having problems working with Lynn, they decided to pull the plug. And in retrospect, the problem was pretty obvious. These were demos. They weren't meant to be part of a final mix. The voice and piano were recorded together on an old tape recorder, so it was impossible to adjust one without affecting the other, and the piano didn't sound great. That's true on all the tracks, but for now and then it was particularly loud. <laughs> making it impossible to include his voice at an acceptable level without ruining the mix. But despite George's objections, Paul wasn't quite ready to abandon the song. He just had to wait until technology caught up with his ambitions, which brings us to the use of AI. When I first heard that the new Beatles song was made with artificial intelligence, I assumed the worst. I figured this would be something like the Beethoven X project a couple years ago, where a group of composers and programmers got together to complete Beethoven's unfinished 10th symphony from the few sketches he'd left behind. The end result was interesting in its own way, but the general reaction from classical music fans was mostly that it was kind of boring, and while it resembled Beethoven's compositional style in some places, it was in no meaningful way a Beethoven symphony. And this reflects a more general trend. From the Tupac hologram to deepfake Sinatra covers, new technologies have made us increasingly able to project our own artistic intentions through the voices and bodies of dead artists, and I don't know about you, but that makes me really uncomfortable. It removes their agency, often implying that this is what they would have done if they were still alive, and since they're not, they can't say otherwise. But is that what's happening here? And kinda? And we'll talk about that nuance later, but mostly no. While working on the Get Back documentary, Peter Jackson developed some software to separate different audio tracks, and they used that to get rid of John's piano. That's it. 
that's all they did. Honestly, it almost feels wrong to call it AI. To most people, that implies a digital agent creating a portion of the work, like if ChatGPT wrote the lyrics or something, and the AI-centric marketing led a lot of people to incorrectly assume that the voice on the track wasn't really John's, which, ignoring a couple punch-ins by Paul, it definitely was. Still, technically, the system used a deep neural net, so sure, it does count as AI. The headlines weren't lying. It's just not a version of AI that raises difficult ethical questions. Stem separation is a basic tool, one that I often use for my videos when I don't have the official instrument tracks for a song I'm analyzing. Jackson built a particularly powerful version, and they borrowed it to get a clean vocal track. And since they still had the parts George had recorded back in the day, Paul and Ringo were finally able to combine everything into one complete, polished song, working with their dearly departed friends one final time. They even had the arrangements done by Giles Martin, the son of their longtime collaborator George Martin, paying tribute as best they could to the legacy of the man often called the Fifth Beatle. But what about the music? This is a music theory channel after all, so I should probably do some analysis. The verse is mostly built on this lovely two chord vamp between A minor and G major. I know it's true. Gently establishing that minor key center with these lush, melancholy piano voicings. At the end of the section, it walks down to E. Which contains a G sharp that contradicts the minor sounding G from the main vamp. This sets up a big, satisfying resolution back to A minor, which we sort of get, but it's subverted through the use of a suspended chord. matching John's vocal melody and adding this haunting sense of incompleteness. And that also comes through in the melodic phrasing. John begins his lines on beat two, mostly avoiding downbeats and leaving large gaps in between small fragments of words, all of which gives his delivery a passive, retrospective view that ties in beautifully with the song's wistful narrative. The chorus features a sudden shift to G major, and I learned from Mike the Snare's video that this was a controversial choice. John's demo featured a more gentle modulation chain, and apparently people wanted that in the final version, but I fundamentally disagree. To my ears, the direct move from A minor to G major between these two sections is a beautiful development of the two chord vamp that defined the verse, and adding more chords in between would just have muddied it up. Moving on, the harmonic rhythm's been flipped. In the verse, they were mostly changing chords once per bar. I know it's true. Switching to two bars each for the end of the phrase. Which drags down the energy like an engine that stalled out. But in the chorus, two bars is the norm. Until the end, where they speed back up, changing every bar to ramp into a conclusion. The progression here is an extremely classic one familiar to any student of Western harmony. It's going 1, 3, 6, 2, 5, establishing the root and then cascading back to it with a series of perfect fifths. The final 2, 5 is especially important as a really clear indication that we're about to return to 1. This is where they speed up and they even repeat the figure twice, but right when you're expecting that big, final, climactic resolution, it just returns once again to A minor and starts the next verse. That A minor softly transforms from the two chord, which demanded resolution, back into the one chord, gently informing you that's all you're gonna get. It's a lovely touch, a perfect mirror to the bold key change at the start of the chorus, and exactly the sort of playful use of key centers you'd expect from the Beatles. John's phrasing also shifts here, starting more lines on the downbeat, and really, I could do a whole video just about these compositional choices, but I don't think that's why this song matters. Now and Then is more than a song, it's a story, and that story is brought to life by its lyrical themes. It's about missing someone, possibly a lover, but also 
also possibly a close friend. That's pretty typical of John's writing in this period, but that's not the context we're hearing it in. Now and Then was written and sung by John Lennon, but once it's presented as the final Beatles song, produced over decades by a slow, introspective collaboration between his former bandmates, it's also very clearly about him. It's some of his closest friends processing their unresolved grief from his sudden tragic death, taking his words and his voice and using them to say goodbye. And in 2001, George died of lung cancer, and the still incomplete song eventually became about him too. And you can see that in the music video, with clips of current day Paul and Ringo performing alongside archive footage of John and George. Paul even recorded the guitar solo as an explicit homage to George, copying all the nuances of the slide guitar style that had become his friend's signature sound in his late career. And this is where it becomes tricky to say if this is truly a Beatles song. Like, sure, it contains John's voice and George's guitar, but the final version includes a lot of changes from the original demo. There's literally an entire section missing because Paul thought it rambled too much, and to be fair, he was right. David Bennett did a whole video comparing the two, which I'll link in the description, but the point is that what was released in 2023 is only vaguely related to what John recorded back in 1977, and probably pretty different from what George thought he was playing on in 1995. In interviews, Paul has likened the process to his old songwriting partnership with John, where one of them would bring in a song and the other would make suggestions and tweaks until they've reached a version they were both happy with. And sure, that's kind of what happened, but it's all in one direction. Paul could only imagine whether John would agree with his suggestions, which brings us back to the question of agency. Is it true that John has genuine artistic contributions on this song, or did Paul just sample him to create his own thing? And to be clear, I have no issue with sampling, but this is being sold as something that John worked on and would have approved of. And maybe that's true. Giles Martin has talked about how they worked really hard to make this sound like an old-school Beatles track, and it does. It really feels like something John could have written. Honestly, it feels more like a Beatles song than either of the 90s singles, but is it really fair to say that John helped make it when he couldn't object to any of Paul's changes? And perhaps more importantly, what about George, who by all accounts didn't even like Now and Then? He apparently told Mark Cunningham that compared to the other things they worked on in that session, it wasn't much of a song, and he left because he didn't want to just be John Lennon's backing band. But that's exactly what he is here. He didn't even get to play his own solo. How would he feel about this being probably the final act of his legacy? And I say probably because while this is very much a sentimental tribute to dearly departed friends, it's also something else. It's also, and I hate to say this, but it's also kind of a marketing gimmick? Like, that's obvious, right? We all recognize that? We live in a media landscape that refuses to let successful properties run their course, inundating us with endless Star Wars series, live-action Disney remakes, and, of course, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But while film is the most obvious offender, this happens in music too, and it's been happening for decades. Popular old acts get wrung out for all they're worth through commemorative editions, greatest hits compilations, and reunion tours. It's a much safer bet to invest in squeezing every little bit of value out of a band with an already established fan base than trying to find the next big thing. And when it comes to reliable performance, the Beatles may well be the gold standard. About a decade ago now, we hit the 50th anniversary of their first performance on The Ed Sullivan Show, an event that's broadly considered the beginning of the British invasion. Suddenly, we were thrown into a flurry of 50th anniversaries of the Beatles doing something or other, and between 2013 and 2019, there were seven different commemorative albums, including live shows, compilations, and special 50th anniversary remasters. Apple Records even sponsored me, 12 Tone, the YouTube channel, to tell people about the new edition of the White Album, which, honestly, they were great to work with, and being able to say I got sponsored by the actual Beatles remains a highlight of my career. But that's not the point. The point is that up until the 50th anniversary of the band's breakup a couple years back, we were in a glut of new Beatles content, and that's not even considering things like Cirque du Soleil's Love or the Beatles edition of Rock Band, both of which came out in the decade prior. The Beatles were proving themselves over and over to still be a reliable cash cow well into the new millennium, and they weren't going to stop just because the anniversaries were over. That would mean leaving money on the table, and labels don't like doing that, so when they saw the opportunity to release something they could reasonably describe as the last Beatles song, 
Of course they did it. And if they can find a way to call something else the real Last Beatles song, they'll do it again. That's an inescapable part of this song's cultural context, and it makes it hard for me to just appreciate it for what the band intended it to be. Now, to be clear, I genuinely believe that for Paul and Ringo, this was a labor of love. They spent decades crafting this one song. The way they talk about it, you can hear the passion and the love they have both for their missing friends and for the process that let them reconnect for one last tune. I'm not accusing them of anything. But it's hard to escape the sense that because this is supposed to be the final Beatles song, I have an obligation to care about it. And, I mean, I like the song. I didn't at first, but it's grown on me as I've spent more time with it. But whether I like it feels almost tangential to the actual discussion. It feels like I'm supposed to care, not just because it's a song worth caring about, but because it carries the entire cultural significance of the Beatles on its back. And that concerns me. Over the years, I've been very clear about my dislike for cultural canons. That is, artists that are considered so transcendentally good and important that they become immune to criticism, exempt from reevaluation, and unaffected by personal taste. I mentioned Beethoven earlier, and he's a perfect example. The mere suggestion that someone might not consider Beethoven to be among the greatest composers ever is enough to anger even the most casual of classical music listeners, and I have the comment section to prove it. But while the Western classical canon is, to my mind, the most frustrating, we've also seen the rise of a more modern canon, a rock canon, consisting of unassailably great bands like Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Queen, Nirvana, and sitting at the very top spot, the Beatles. It's harder for me to criticize this list because I do like many of these bands, but it has all the same problems. This crystallization of taste is bad for new artists, and it's bad for listeners. Of course, that's not the fault of the bands themselves. All they did was make great songs that people liked. But by holding them up as untouchable paragons of music decades after their heyday, we let them monopolize the cultural landscape, sucking up all the attention and investment that other lesser-known artists need need in order to break through. This leads to the wildly incorrect belief that no one's making great music anymore, and it obscures the diverse and beautiful scenes these bands grew out of in the first place. It reduces music history to a flat progression of divinely inspired revolutionary artists with no influences, no contemporaries, and no cultural roots. Like, for all the attention the Beatles get, how often do we talk about Donovan? So with that in mind, I find myself drawn to the same question Mike the Snare asked in his video. Did we really need a new Beatles song? And that's a hard question for me to answer. I was born in 1989. Beatlemania has only ever been history for me. Fortunately, though, I am not the only human being that exists. My uncle Bob grew up in the 60s, worked in a record store in the 70s, and still plays guitar in a rock band to this day. If the new Beatles song has a target audience, it's my uncle Bob, so I called him up and asked him what he thought. We had a very long conversation, but the part that really stuck with me in and the part I'll play for you now was his answer to my central question. What does it mean for there to be new Beatles music in 2023? Mean for who, right? So I'm thinking about what it means for Paul and Ringo, mostly at the moment. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, I just think it's, you know, a great thing to have done. A fun project, you know, a good reason to get together and hang out and, you know, give back. And, you know, I think give back to George too. So, you know, I think that's great. What does it mean for the world? Well, you know, for the record company, it means they're hoping more sales and more attention and more marketing and, you know, all that stuff. And that's their business. I don't mind. For the rest of us, you know, I'm glad it's out there. I'm glad it exists. I'm, you know, like I said, I'm not going to buy it, but I'm, I'm really glad it's, I'm really glad that they've done it. And also, it's just really nice to hear John's voice again. Well, and it's not just his voice. It's his songwriting, his piano playing, you know, it just, it, it really does feel like him. Yeah. And I, and I think all the story around it is really interesting, too. I think the, the technology is interesting. I think, you know, their choices are interesting. Just the choice to chop out the song, the choices to make the arrangements that they did, the choices to, you know, pull backing vocals from here and there because they could and make it work. There's a lot of work that goes into that, you know, and um, I, think it's, I think it's great for all those reasons. 
That conversation really changed my perspective. I am, by nature, a pretty cynical person. It would have been easy to write this off as a pointless gimmick, a product of rock culture's weird obsession with one band that stopped making music half a century ago, but talking to someone who came of age at the height of Beatlemania, who witnessed the band's tumultuous breakup in real time, and who lived through the shared cultural trauma that was John Lennon's murder, it becomes much easier to see this as a long overdue moment of emotional catharsis. I talked earlier about how Paul used John's words to send him a message, but Bob pointed out to me that the ambiguity in John's lyrics made it pretty likely that he was also, at some level, writing about Paul. Near the end of his life, John had started to reconnect with some of his old bandmates, and the nostalgia brought on by those slowly rekindling friendships may have worked its way into his music. And that's not entirely speculation. According to rock and roll pioneer Carl Perkins, Linda McCartney told him in 1981 that John's final words to Paul were, think about me every now and then, old friend. And John Lennon was not a man to be careless with his words. Even if it was a coincidence, hearing that same haunting phrase on an unreleased demo 15 years later must have been a really profound moment for Paul. Maybe that's why he was so desperate to complete the song, despite George's lack of interest. He needed to tell John that he heard him, and that he missed him too. So if this is really gonna be the final Beatles song, then I think it's a good one. I still feel kinda weird about George's place in all this, but overall, I'm glad it exists, even if only for Paul and Ringo's sake. It's a good send-off, a final conversation across time, not between legends, but between friends. Friends who loved each other, friends who missed each other, and friends who just wanted to make music together one final time. And yeah, thanks for watching all the way to the end. This was a bit of a long one, bit of a rambly one, and I'm still not entirely sure I have a convincing answer, but I feel better having asked the questions, you know? I'm not really sure I need to decide whether this was a good or a bad thing, but I don't know, it just struck a nerve and... I wanted to spend some time thinking about it. As always, I really appreciate the support of my Patreon patrons, and a special thanks to Susan Jones, Jill Sungard, Howard Levine, Warren Hewitt, Damian Fuller Sutherland, John Hancock, and Jeff for being extremely generous with their support. If you've watched this far and you want to help me make more videos and potentially even pick the songs I analyze in future ones, Patreon will always be the best way to do that. But even if you don't, thanks for watching. That's always the most important thing. It's what I make these for, and... I hope some of this helped answer some sort of questions for you, or at least gave you interesting questions to think about on your own. Uh, beyond that, I guess all I have left to say is don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, as always, keep on rocking.